It is still morning, a few minutes till noon, but we are still morning. I'm reading with you from the book of John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. Let's read together from John chapter 10, verse 10. These are the words of Jesus. The Bible says, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you because you're the giver of life and when you give it, you give it more abundantly. We acknowledge and recognize the fact that we live this side of the universe where we get sick, so many diseases, wars, Life is not just enough, and sometimes we die. Thank you, because Jesus is the giver of life. As we open your word, we pray for your blessing and understanding. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. We are going to deliberate this morning on this title, Life in Abundance, Now and Forever. Life in abundance. What do you think about life in abundance or abundant life? What is it to you? Have you ever experienced abundant life or you have not? What is it to you? Even the question of the idea of experiencing life forever, now and forever. What is forever to me and what is forever to you? Because I have never lived in forever, you have never lived in forever. We only know ourselves because we live this side of the universe where people live and die. Life in abundance. Several weeks ago, I took a break from what I do normally. I went to Malawi. Besides doing other things, I was involved in the preaching of God's word for a period of two weeks. But we decided that, along with that, we are going to run a health expo for the entire period of my series. And what we did was, every morning from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we opened a clinic at the church where I was conducting meetings. It was, it was not in an open place, but it was in a church building like this one. But every morning, we opened the place. And we saw people, men and women, young and old, coming to see those that we asked to come and help us. Some were from the nearby district hospital, in Cheo District Hospital. Some were clinicians, some were nurses, some were eye specialists, and they just helped us quite a lot. And some of them were students, also from the University of Malawi. They, they, they are training as doctors. They came to work with us at that time. We saw some who came from Malamulo, some who are lecturers and tutors and those who teach people how to measure body fluids and all those kinds of things. And they came along with us. So we did a few things like uh, checking uh, their blood pressures and a few things like um, checking how their uh, blood is running. If there is a problem with them, we could not deal with the problem maybe sometimes right there and then, but we referred them to clinicians at the hospital, and we made a very good link because the district hospital opened their doors and they said, you can come and work with us. So the difficult cases, we referred them to the nearby hospital. But with so many people coming and receiving assistance, receiving advice, receiving help, in the evening before we conducted meetings, for those who did not attend the clinics, we, what we did was to give some health for living lectures to those who attended in the evenings. We saw a lot of change in such a way that people said we want to live a different life from now into the future. What we saw was that people were sick, some of the things that we could not understand. Some had been living with their illnesses for a long time, 
And some of them said, they said, Pastor, I just want to live. I just want to live. I just want to enjoy life. But for many years, I've not enjoyed my life. And I said to myself, what is life then? What is life then? The last thing that happened that was exciting was that one of the Sundays, the last Sunday, that was the last Sunday of our meeting. No, 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 that was not the last Sunday. The first Sunday of our meetings, one of the dentists came from Blunt Adventist Hospital. She's a young lady from the Philippines. She came looking very small and very young, but very committed. We had borrowed some equipment to help this dentist at this place. We saw her doing her work. Since morning, she never rested. We tried to offer her some lunch. She said, I don't want to eat. I want to help these people. At the end of the day, about 25 or 26 of them, they were assisted. Not much, but at least their teeth were pulled out. Not much, but their teeth were pulled out. And they went home praising God because their teeth were giving them problems. And I said to myself, there is more work that can be done by the church, wherever we are, because God has decided, has ordained that we become reservoirs of God's grace in all the world. So in a very small way, even in a very big way, we can be of assistance. And each one of us young people and old people, men and women, we still have a place in God's work. Life in abundance. What is life in abundance? History is his story. History is his story. There are people who think that things just happen on their own. When you get better, you get rich, things are going well. Some think that things happen on their own. But I've come to believe that there is nothing that happens on its own. It happens because God is in charge, especially when there are good things. God is in charge of many good things. Children love stories. I saw them listening to stories. They love stories. And sometimes when parents are not around, they, they have chances, of course, of watching stories and looking at stories when those who tell stories, they're not around. But children love stories. However, they are told they love stories. Story, stories of people who are known and stories of people who are not even known. The stories of great families, stories of princes and kings and queens, the stories of some music artists. People love to hear stories and people love to tell stories. But there is a story of stories. It is the story of Jesus. There is a song that is sung, tell me the story. Tell me the old, old story. A story that goes beyond all the stories of the world. It is the story of one person called Jesus. Yes, you have stories that you are aware of, stories of some, uh, some leaders, some political figures in Africa, political figures in the East, in the West, and around, around the world. We love to tell those stories, and we love to read news about these people. But the story of Jesus is slightly different or more different from the other stories that we have read about. The story of Jesus is more than my story. It is more than your story. It is more than a story of each one of us here present. It is the story of stories. And Jesus is different because we are taught from the word that whatever he said was supposed to happen in future. For instance, he talked in Matthew chapter 24 verse 5, he says, false Christs are going to come in the future. And in 24 verse 11, he also said, false prophets are going to come in the future. And these things happened. And he said like this, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. That's Jesus. To deceive, if possible, even the very elect, those who are elected. So many stories. The Bible talks about Jesus as a lamb, and he's contrasted to another animal, to a beast. He's totally different in the book of Revelation. He's different from the beast. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. But Jesus is a hero whose luster, whose light shines brighter through the ages. Many people, many families, many governments, many people around the world, they have chosen once upon a time to ignore the story of Jesus. To, story, to, to, to ignore whatever Jesus has talked about. To ignore the truths about Jesus. But the light of Jesus, the light of his truth, keeps shining all the time from the ages past to ages in future. In John chapter 3, verse 6, verse 38, the Bible says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. And in another place he said also, these are the scriptures that testify about me. Let me pause for a moment. When Jesus talks about the scriptures that talk about him, he's referring to the Old Testament portion of the Bible. He's talking about Genesis through the, the book of Malachi. Everything that you find in Genesis, in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, in Judges, Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, the Psalms, the book of Job, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Micah, Nahum, and all the books of the Old Testament. These are the ones that talk about me. Every book that has been written in the Old Testament talks about me. Because when you read in the, in the book of Genesis, you find that Jesus is the creator. And you find that when you read about Jesus, he is the rock of ages. Jesus is the water of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus, his story is written, recorded in the Old Testament from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Malachi. The story of Jesus is written therein. But you need to read and study to find Jesus in these pages. A life of Jesus or the life of Jesus is the life that was written before it existed on earth. In other words, it is a life that is written beforehand. Prophecies dealing with Jesus, with, um, about his birth and man of his birth and his betrayal and man of his death, these were recorded in the Old Testament. For instance, Matthew, uh, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, Bethlehem Ephrata, out of you shall come for me, forth to me, the one to be the, the ruler of Israel. Out of Bethlehem came someone who would be greater than, uh, than the kings of the world. It happened years after, decades after, centuries after, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. In Luke 2 verse 7, the Bible says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let me pause for a moment. Somebody has made a comment about swaddling clothes. I don't know if some of us are aware of swaddling clothes. I do not know what swaddling clothes are all about. But somebody has said, swaddling clothes, swaddling clothes, these are clothes that are used for people who are dead. That's how somebody puts it. Swaddling clothes. I don't know what your interpretation is and what your translation is. But the writer does not make a mistake. He records the event of Jesus' birth. Isaiah 7 verse 14. Behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Im Anu well, his name is going to be called Im Anu Well, with us God. Im Anu Well. It is not an English word, it is a Hebrew word. Im Anu Well, with us God. His name is going to be called with us God. In as much as the enemy may want to triumph in my life, he may want to triumph in my family, in your family, in the church and around the world. But still, God remains, Jesus remains, Im Anu Well, God with us. In spite and despite all the difficulties that we go through, Jesus is still God with his people, God among his people. Luke 1 verse 28 through verse 31, the Bible says, The angel said to her, you will, bear, you, you will be with a child and give birth to a son, and you are to give the name, his, his name, you're going to give him the name Jesus. The angel who spoke to this woman, Mary, he's the same who spoke to, uh, to Joseph. He's the same who spoke to Elizabeth. He's the same who spoke to the people of old. The angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20 through verse 25. I'll read again. Behold, a virgin shall be with a child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, well, which is being interpreted God with us. The other day I went to Peniel Church. That's maybe about 15 months ago. They called me to preach at Peniel Church. This is in Centurion. 
after my preaching appointment, I went out and I was talking to this man. Then his wife came through. Maybe he has forgotten what happened this day. It was not a bad thing, it was a good thing. But she came through and she says to him, did you not say that after the sermon, you are going to go to the car? And this man said to her, I have changed my mind. Then she went, she never talked about anything else. Then I asked him, I said to him, why did you ask your wife, why, why did you tell your wife that you have changed your mind? He said to me, Pastor, I told her that I've changed my mind because wise people change their minds too. So I'm wise, so I changed my mind. The Bible talks about the wise people, talks about the shepherds who followed the star. The writer of the word does not make a mistake. He says, talks about the wise people, the wise men, those who came from the east. They did nothing else on this day when Jesus was born. They followed the star. They followed the star. Wise people from the east followed the star. Today, those who are wise, they still follow the star of Jesus. They still follow Jesus. Regardless of how embarrassing the story may be, they still follow the story of Jesus. Sometimes the story of Jesus does not make sense at all to me and to others, but those who are wise, they still follow the star. Some people actually sometimes, they choose to change their minds, not just change them, changing their minds, but changing their hearts. Sometimes they confess their sins. Sometimes they repent. They say, God, please forgive me. I'm willing to chart another course of my direction. I'm willing to change my direction, direction in my life. And the Bible says, the angel of the Lord appeared and spoke to the shepherds about the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through verse 12. Numbers 24, verse 17, the prophecy says, There shall come a star out of Jacob. There shall come a star out of Jacob. People waited for the Messiah to come. The Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Wise people follow the star. They might not have been Jews. They might not have been people who read the Bible very well at that time, but they were wise. Not just wise in the things of the world. They were also wise to read the times and to know about the star, and they followed the star. The three wise men followed the star to find the place where Jesus was born. They quoted Micah 5 verse 2 when they spoke to King Herod. We have seen the star. As it was written in, in the scriptures, as it was written, it was prophesied in the Old Testament. So we follow the star. We would like to see where the king is born, where he was born. They came to Jesus to where he was born. He was lying in the manger. And they came and worshipped the king who was looking like a child. The wise men understood that baby Jesus was the expected Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. For the shepherds and the wise people, when Jesus was born, it was not just like business as usual. It was a totally different thing altogether. It was not business as usual. Something great had happened at this time. Jesus was born, and King of Kings was born, and Lord of Lords was born. What does the coming of Jesus as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings mean to you? What does it mean to you? Is it business as usual? Or it's something to look forward to. It is something to cherish, something to be happy about, something to be excited about. Jesus did not keep quiet. Jesus did not, did not conceal his identity. He revealed who he was. Quoting from the Isaiah chapter 6, verse 61, verse 1 and verse 2, Jesus said in the book of Luke chapter 4, he said, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to comfort all who mourn. He repeated these words in the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and verse 19. Jesus 
openly declared his identity to the Jewish religious leaders of that time. Jesus is different from other people in the world because Jesus is the giver of life. Jesus gives life to those who were dead and Jesus came close to them. He touched them and they rose, they came back to life. Jesus is a life giver. He is not a life giver then, only he is also a life giver today. Jesus raised dead people. He brought them to life. He healed the sick. He forgave sinners. Those who were heartbroken because they had committed some crime, Jesus came to them and forgave them. What man of a person is this who can forgive people's sins? Allow me to declare also and to resonate with some of my colleagues here. We have come to believe that forgiveness is a choice. To the one who forgives, he decides to forgive. To the one who must be forgiven, she, he must choose to be forgiven. You have to ask for forgiveness. Forgive me. Forgiveness does not happen by accident. You have to ask, talk to the other person. Please, my brother, please, my sister. Please, my cousin, please, my uncle. Please, mom, please, dad, forgive me. To be forgiven is a choice. And to forgive is a choice. How do I know? To forgive, the one who is asking for forgiveness does not have to make sense to you. Whatever he says, whatever she says, does not have to make sense. And when you seek forgiveness, you do not have to make sense to explain exactly what happened in your life. You seek forgiveness because it is good for you. It is good for the family. It is good for, you, good for your soul. Forgiveness is a choice. Jesus chose to forgive people even those who were not supposed to be forgiven. He chose to make life easy for the others. He forgave them. Those who were lucky also, they asked for forgiveness. The story of this woman who was caught in adultery, and they brought him to Jesus. They dragged him, actually. They were very cruel, ruthless. They brought him, they brought her to them, to him. And they said to him, to Jesus, Jesus, According to the law of Moses, this woman is supposed to be stoned to death. What do you say? And the Bible says in the book of John chapter 8, the Bible says that Jesus did nothing, spoke nothing, but he stooped low and began writing on the sand, began writing on the ground, and he wrote, he wrote. The Bible does not declare really what he was writing about. But the story says that one by one, they came to check and to see what was being written on the ground, and one by one left the scene, left the place, and went away. And the Bible only records the fact that Jesus and the woman remained all by themselves. And Jesus said to her, where are they who are accusing you? And the woman said, I do not know they are gone out of this place. The world may condemn you. The world may condemn me for any reason. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what the Apostle Paul talks about. God chooses to forgive me. He chooses to forgive you, not because I deserve forgiveness. I do not deserve forgiveness. I deserve death. I deserve punishment, even capital punishment. He raised the dead from the grave. How do I know? A story is recorded of a man who was once a friend of Jesus. His name is Lazarus. He died. For four days he was in the grave. But Jesus came to his grave and he said, Lazarus, my friend, Come out of the grave. Lazarus, my friend, come out. And the story says that Lazarus came out and stood and was still bound with the clothes from the graveyard or from the grave. He was still bound. And Jesus said to them, loosen him. Make him loose. Make him go free. Make him go free. He's from the dead, that's fine. But make him go free. He's incomplete as a human being. Please make him free. Loosen him. Make him loose. And they did it. He came out of the grave a free man. Jesus, he's still able to help people, those who are dead in their trespasses, those who are dead in their iniquities, those who are still overladen with sin, he is still able to say, come out, my friend, come out, my friend. The four days that 
Lazarus spent in the grave as a dead person did not obliterate the love of Jesus upon Lazarus. Jesus is so loved Lazarus. Anyhow, death did not change the mind of God. Death did not change the mind of Jesus. Jesus still recognized Lazarus as his friend. Jesus is still making friends today. Jesus is in the business of making friends today. Because even if, even if you remove everything else in the world, but what God has tried to do over the ages past is trying to make friends, to make you his friend, to make us his friends so that we can live together forever. Because once upon a time, God and people lived together. God and people lived together in paradise in the Garden of Eden. But sin brought this problem where people have to live far away from God. But God is in the business of restoring relationships. Because I read from some place in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. The Bible says that, And God said, Let us make a human being in our own image. And in his image he made them both male and female. God is in the business of restoring his image in people, in you and in me. Allow me to declare to you, to submit to you that time does not change God's agenda of changing people's minds, of changing people's hearts. Prophecies were fulfilled at the end of his life. Whatever happened at the, at the end of his life were fulfilled. Those things that were prophesied in the Old Testament, they were fulfilled like the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine, this was fulfilled. In Psalm chapter 41, verse 9, the Bible says, Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. We can guess and know that the, he, the Psalms were talking about somebody who would come, and this was fulfilled in the life of Judas, in what G Judas was trying to do to crucify in order to betray uh, the man called Jesus. Christ. Allow me also to say that the greatest prophecies talk about Jesus Christ. Whatever you find in, the, in God's holy word, whatever you find here, talks about Jesus and Jesus alone. It talks about many other things that's very true. The stories of Israel, the crossing of the Red Sea, and many other things. The, 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 the water flowing from the rock and um, the feeding of the children of Israel and all those stories. But if you forget everything else, remember the prophecies of the Old Testament, they all point to Jesus and Jesus alone. Zechariah 11, verse 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. This was a prophecy talking about the betrayal of Jesus Christ where people gave money, where Judas gave, uh, received money. He received money for the sake of the life of Jesus, thinking that he's going to make more money by doing that. He could not make more money, he could not enjoy his life, he could not enjoy this money because the spiritual prophecy talks about the death of Judas. He died miserably. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the porter in the house of the Lord. This happened. For instance, the amount of money that was given for the life of Jesus, the result and the place, exactly they were fulfilled in the New Testament when Jesus lived and when Jesus was betrayed, crucified and died. Matthew 25, 27, verse 5, and verse 7. The Bible says, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. That is what Judas did. And they took counsel and bought with them the porters filled to bury strangers in. That's what happened with, what Jesus, with, uh, with the life of Jesus, with the buying of Jesus, with the purchase of Jesus, selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is still the answer. He is still an answer to many problems. Isaiah 50 verse 6 says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. This happened when Jesus was crucified, before he was crucified. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. That's what the Old Testament talks about. Jesus truly was spat upon. Jesus truly was crucified. Jesus, Jesus truly was mocked and they abused him. There was a day that a criminal was supposed to be released and his name is Barabbas. When they found no reason to punish Jesus, 
They said, but what do we do? Because we're supposed to release one, one of the criminals. Either we release Jesus or we release Barabbas. They said, release for us Barabbas and let Jesus be crucified. And the Bible talks in the book of Psalms 22 verse 16. They pierced my hands and feet. And surely that's what happened. Zechariah 12 verse, 12, 12 verse 10 says, they will look on me whom they pierced. That's very true. Jesus died like a criminal. Jesus took my place so that I may be treated like him. I do not deserve this life. You do not deserve this life. Jesus took my place and he took your place. I was supposed to die, but Jesus took my place. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Jesus suffered. Jesus died. Jesus took my place. A difference happened this day. Two people were dying along with Jesus. The other one sat or was crucified on the other side, the other one on the other side. The other one spoke words like, if you are the son of God and you did many miracles, why don't you save us? Why don't you save yourself? And the other one said, Jesus, Savior, when you come into your kingdom, please remember me. Please remember me. Asking for forgiveness or asking God to remember you in his kingdom is a choice that is not forced upon you. It is a choice that I make. It is the choice that you make. Even criminals, even those who are in jail, even those who are in prison, even those who are serving a death sentence, those who are almost at the end of their lives in prison chains, some of them have made a commitment. Please God, help me. Forgive me. I've never lived a good life, but please forgive me. The story says that the bones of Jesus were not broken at all. The other bones of the other criminals who were dying with Jesus on the cross, their bones were broken because they were still alive at the time that, was the, that the sun was about to set. But the Bible says that Jesus was a little different. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Allow me to also submit to you that Jesus is self-existent. Jesus keeps his own life. No one gives life to Jesus because he's the creator. He's self-existent. He does not get his life from somewhere, someplace. He has got abundant life. He has got enough life to share with those who need this life. That's why he says in the book of John chapter 14, verse 1 to verse 3, he says, In my father's house, in my father's house are many mansions. How big is that house? How big is that house? It only shows that God has a big heart to accept, to receive a sinner. No matter where you have been, no matter what you have done, no matter how long you have lived in sin, God's heart is so wide. God's heart is so big. God's love is so tough, it is so wide, so high, so deep, so big, so much so that it accommodates everyone who comes to him. I read in some place also in the book of John chapter 1 verse 12, the Bible says that, but to those who received him, he gave power for them to be called sons and daughters of God. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. The prophet said he will never lose his bones because people are going to break his bones. Jesus, the cross of Jesus, still stands there today as a symbol of what God is able to do for you and for me. And when Jesus, when Jesus rose on Sunday morning, it is an event that people did not expect to happen because Jesus died on Friday. And people so frustrated, those who loved him, those who walked with him, his disciples, their hope was lost. But Jesus kept on talking and teaching, although people never understood it. 
he said to them, even to the two sisters, Martha and Mary, he said to them, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's why we started like this. Life in abundance, now and forever. Allow me to make a careless statement in your presence. The careless statement is this one. For me, life and death are the same. Life and death are the same. It does not matter whether I die at the age of 50. It does not matter whether I, leave, whether I die at the age of 20 or at the age of 10. It is not the quantity of life that makes a difference. It is the quality of life that makes a difference. I do not care how many years I'm going to live. I do not care how many years you're going to live. I do not care how many years my children are going to live in this world. But one thing I know is that if I believe in Jesus and I take hold of him and I take him at his word, he is going to live with me now and forevermore. And when he gives life, he gives life more abundant. He gives life that I can enjoy. I can even begin enjoying the fruits of that life even right now. That's why we sang that song. He lives. He lives. He lives. And you ask me why I say what I say. I say what I say because he lives in my heart. Amen. You do not know what I know. But I know what I know. When my feet were careless, when they did not know when to come home, when my hands touched whatever they wanted to touch, when my eyes saw whatever they wanted to see, when my brain wandered around everywhere else, Jesus saved my life. You do not know where I was, but Jesus knows where I was, and he knows where I am today. Amen. Jesus knows you. Jesus knows me. There is no part of my life, there is no part of your life that he's not aware of, he's not acquainted with. Because somebody has said in a song, even tears are a language that God understands. I'm the resurrection and the life. We are closing now. If he is the life, if he is the resurrection, if he is the resurrection and the life, how do you take it? When you go to Israel today, although there are conflicting stories, there's the garden tomb, but also when you go to some part in Jerusalem up there, you find a place that people claim that this is the place that the tomb of Jesus was. And they make claims and they sing songs and tourists go and see this place. But there's also another place that people claim to be Golgotha, although it is a taxi rank this time. There's a taxi rank right there. It's a taxi rank, but they say this is Golgotha. And there's a garden tomb there. When you go there, you find a grave that is empty. And some of us have been to that, that place. You enter in the place, you say, well, it makes sense. It looks that, that this theory is plausible that Jesus lied in this place. But I do not care whether he lied here or he lied there, but what we know is that the grave of Jesus is empty and that he lives forevermore. That's the story that I know and that's the story we can share today. Many people around the world, in the rural areas, in the urban areas, in the cities, they have embraced the story of Jesus, the story of stories, and they have committed their lives to Jesus. I think of people in Botswana, people in South Africa, people in Switzerland, in Lesotho, in Madagascar, in Mauritius, in Congo, in the DRC, wherever. There are people everywhere, everywhere in Zimbabwe, there are people who have embraced the story of Jesus and they say, even if you take away everything from me but don't, don't take away the story of Jesus what, is, what does the story of Jesus mean, mean to you? Because somebody said, my story has a small s and his story has a big s because his story embraces my story and your story, and your story, and your story. Blessed are they who are able to interpret their stories in the light of the bigger picture of the big story of Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is still a problem solver. Somebody said the door into your heart has one knob, has one door handle only, and the door is inside of you. Outside there's nothing. What Jesus does is to knock on your door all the time. He keeps knocking on the door, but it depends upon you to give him permission to come in. He will never force himself into your life. He asks you to open your door, to open the heart of your door. He is still a forgiving savior. He is still a life-changing life Lord. He is still a miracle worker. Where I come to an end of my life, 
Jesus says, let's take it from here. Let's move into the future. Uh, there are some of us in our midst today who are hopeless and helpless. Maybe you've come to the end of your plans, at the end of your agenda, at the end of the road of your life, and sometimes you're saying, I want to give up about what I'm doing right now. Jesus is still a problem solver. He's still a miracle worker. Allow me to share with you these words. These are not my words, but the words of a writer, an artist, who has sung before, and I'll repeat these words. How can I say thanks unto the Lord for the things he has done for me? Things so undeserved, yet he gave to prove his love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I have and ever ought to be, Lord, I owe to thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. With his blood, he has saved me. With his power, he has raised me to go be the glory for the things he has done. I want to receive the life that is abundant now and forevermore. Those who would like to agree with me that would like to receive this life now forevermore, can I see your hands right now? May God bless you. May he continue to love you. All the time of your lives, may God bless you. Amen.